Well, hello there, and a very, very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us live for this webinar this evening or this morning, this afternoon, depending exactly where in the world that you're listening from. Uh, my name is Sharon Mark Taggart. I am the co founder and director of the Curious Piano Teachers. And we are really excited today um, to be introducing you to uh, Dr. Julie Nair and Catherine Fisher, who are the co-authors of Piano Safari. And I'm just going to run through very quickly. There's going to be three things that you guys are going to be learning on this webinar today. The first thing is the seven Piano Safari animal techniques that um, Julie Nair has derived from her from her PhD research. Um, the second thing is you'll be learning about the benefits of rote teaching in the early stages of study. And then the third thing is the advantages to using an interval like reading approach. So um, Catherine and Julie are going to be guiding and sharing, um, guiding you through and sharing their philosophy for, uh, for Piano Safari. And I see that lots of you have been just hopping on. <laughs> it's incredible. We have we have um, close to six hundred people registered for this webinar. Which um, and I will actually get some of you to say because it'd be good to know if I'm sure there are many of you on this webinar who are already using Piano Safari. But it'd be really especially interesting if you have. If this is just a brand new. Um, uh, if Piano Safari is brand new to you and you, you maybe heard about it for the first time um, when we advertised this webinar. So this is great. Uh, I, this is great, Sharon. <laughs> so we've I'm got just people gonna... just coming. Out, oh, from all over the place. We've got Missouri. <laughs> I'm going to say hello to Louise in Bonhaven, which is exactly I'm... where I am today, Louise. <laughs> I'm just going to say this is, um, I was popping over, we're going to get out of, out of routine, but this is uh, Dr. Sally Cathcart, who is again my co-finder, also the co-finder and director of the Curious Piano Teachers. So Sally, we're not going to be able to keep up no, with reading up with all of these, these names. No. So I'm just going to go from the bottom and I'm going to um, give a shout out to some of you, but just know that every single one of you are so welcome on this call. So we have Diane. Uh, from Atlanta, we have Amy from Westminster in London, we have Shauna from Pasadena, California, we have Derek from Scotland, we have Juan from Spain. I'm going to we say hello to Barbara to, from Toronto in, in Canada. Lovely, we and have Brenda in North Carolina. Tracy from Michigan. We have Lisbeth, hello Lisbeth. From Ohio, we have Diana in Tennessee. We We've have got Ginny from Texas, who says she, we know she's from Texas since she used YOL. I'm not <laughs> sure I said that in quite the right way, Ginny, but you know, um, we we know what exactly what you mean. Candy from Sacramento. Gosh, so many people from all over the place. Brighton, Janice, Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. Jenna says hello uh, from Illinois. Um, we have Karen, um, who is in Cambridgeshire. Um, oh, somebody from sunny Santa Barbara in California. We're just we're just sitting here with our curtains closed, actually, because it's uh, dark, <laughs> <laughs> dark out there in, in in our part of the world. I'm afraid. So yes, I'm dreaming of sunny skies in California. Uh, we have Gemma from Cork in Ireland. Um, we have Amy from Oklahoma, we have Jenny from Birmingham, uh, <clears throat> Amy says I have a blank screen, uh, can I suggest Amy that you come out of a call and come back in again because sometimes that works. Mm -hmm. um, Crystal is saying, thank you for creating this method. <laughs> um, absolutely revolutionary. Um, so absolutely, for those of you who um, are on this call tonight wanting to know what is Piano Safari, well, you're in for a treat. And I'm going to hand over to Sally, and then we're going to give a very special welcome to our guests. So Sally, over to you for a few moments. Yeah, I'm just going to say hi, Maya, from Newbury, which is where I live, really. So great to see so many of, many of you here. As Sharon said, I'm, I'm Sally Cathcart. 
And just like you, I'm a piano teacher. And just like you, I've been discovering piano safari and um, delighted to have um, Julie and Catherine here with us again to, to talk about it a little bit further. Before we hand over to them, um, just want to tell those of you that are that don't know anything about the Curious Piano Teachers um, that Sharon and I have been running this community of piano teachers. We get very excited, as you can tell, about our teaching and quite passionate about making making sure that our pupils get the really best musical education that they that they deserve. Music plays an important part in our lives, and as piano teachers, we play an important role in our in our pupils' lives as well. Um, delighted to say that we are going to be opening up our doors just for a very brief um, time at the end of this webinar today. If you're interested in coming and joining us in the community, you will be able to do so. And I think Sharon's going to be giving you a link later on. We've got lots of exciting things going on in there. We have our monthly curiosity boxes. I've just um, put together the November box where we're looking at all sorts of, um, well, we've called it the social pianist, because you know how there's this Christmas carol effect, as I call it, where students want to play Christmas carols. And why do they want to play it? Because they know them and because other people know them. So all of a sudden their piano playing has value. So we're looking at lots of different kind of Christmas songs, Christmas repertoire. So, for example, one of the videos I show you how to do and um, how to teach Walking in the Air by rote and um, as a duet so a uh, sort of an intermediate level pupil gets to do the chords and the other pupils at the top get to do a duet so you know and I show you a step-by-step -step approach to do it so that's one of the things that we've got just one of the things that we've got in the November repertoire list and of course as you as a member of the community you also get an ongoing discount for things like Piano Safari and Alfred UK and others as well. We get all sorts of special discounts and they are growing the number of discounts that we're getting. Anyhow, enough from me. I'll just try and contain my excitement a bit longer and, um, and hand back over to Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Lovely. I see there's a couple of people who are obviously having a few problems connecting. Sally, can I maybe get you to message um, because I think the reconnecting, going out and coming back in is what's working. Uh, okay, so I am going to say the biggest, the warmest welcome to Dr. Julie Nair and to uh, Catherine Fisher. Seriously, we are super pumped to have you in this call. It is, it is our privilege to have you here uh, with us today. And uh, Catherine, I think that you're going um, to start. So I'm going to hand right over to you. We're really looking forward to this. Thank you Wonderful. so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. A big uh, thank you, of course, to Sharon and Sally for hosting us. Um, we're so pleased to be back uh, here with the Curious Piano Teachers on a webinar. Uh, in our first webinar, we focused on rote teaching and its benefits. During this webinar, as Sharon mentioned earlier, we would like to show the first level of the Piano Safari method, focusing on the three main components of Piano Safari, which include technique, rote pieces, and our reading approach. So just before we start, uh, I think you can see Catherine, she's in Ohio, and I'm Julie, and I'm in my studio in Windsor, Connecticut. And now I'm going to screen share so that you can all see the PowerPoint. Let's see if this will work here. Okay, we're good to go. That's perfect. That looks great. I'm just hopping back in here to say that, Julie. Good okay, go. great. <laughs> Wonderful. So, a Piano Safari is a series of tutor books for beginners. It's designed for the average age beginner, ages 5 through 11, but we have found it can be used successively with students even as young as 4. It takes students an average of one year to finish level 1. There are three levels of Piano Safari, and I just want to go over this quickly so you have an overview of the method. Um, Repertoire Book 1 is an all-in-one book. It contains technique, rote, reading, uh, theory, and improvisation. And the sight reading cards uh, are not just a supplement to the Repertoire Book. We feel they're necessary to enhance our reading approach because um, there are 16 um, additional reading examples uh, per unit that students um, can use to build their intervallic reading skills. So um, more on that a little bit later. Just notice in level two and level three that uh, the technique is separated from the repertoire book. So again, in level one, the technique is included in the repertoire book, and then in two and three, 
we have a separate book. Um, also not pictured here is uh, the fact that we have audio for level one and two um, that's available as a digital download and in the US as a CD. So our goal in Piano Safari is to provide an integrated curriculum to develop a musically literate student, one that can read music, which we think of as visual literacy, and one who can also understand music or aural literacy. To provide this integrated curriculum between the eyes and ears, we offer the following components in Piano Safari. Technique, road pieces, reading pieces in the sight reading cards, improvisation, theory, and I just want to say here that although there are theory pages in the repertoire books, uh, we are currently writing additional theory books for levels in one and two to provide even more reinforcement of the theory concepts. We hope to have these books available in the spring at the latest. Um, also, we have website support. There are videos for students and parents um, to remind them of the rote pieces in particular, so students can watch those at home as like many tutorials after the lesson. And we also have uh, materials for teachers, uh, such as videos, essays, and uh, a teacher guide for every level. So from this list, our webinar will focus on the technique, rote, and reading to give you an overview of the main topics of the method. So we'd like to begin uh, first with technique. So in Piano Safari, the technical progression is as follows. In level one, we have the seven animal techniques, and we will be talking about these quite extensively um, in just a moment. So I'm just going to move on and tell you a bit about what's in level two and three so you can see uh, the scope of the technical progression. In level two, uh, students are learning pentascales um, in different variations. They learn how to play these in major and minor um, on all the white and black keys. Um, the same with triads. And special exercises, um, some examples of these would be uh, working on rotation or circular motion with a wrist or um, scale preparation exercises. So then in level three, um, students move on to more common patterns such as two octave scales, inversions, um, chord progressions. The accompaniment patterns they learn are, um, some samples of these would be Alberti bass or waltz bass, and they learn how to harmonize with those. Um, and we have special exercises like hand and exercises and variations and double thirds exercises. And so this book is geared toward the early intermediate student. Um, we cover the keys of C, G, um, and F and their relative minors in level three. So students will learn all of those patterns in the keys I just mentioned. We wanted to mention also that this uh, technical progression in level three corresponds well with uh, RCM or the music development program in the US at about the level one, um, not the prep levels, but level one. Today we're going to focus um, in talking on technique about um, the seven animal techniques found in level one. And these came out of my dissertation research. Growing up, I didn't have very good technical training. So um, I wanted to do a practical dissertation that explored how to teach beginning level techniques so that I could make sure I was teaching my students the right way. This is a picture of one of my little friends standing next to my dissertation in the University of Oklahoma Library. Hopefully someday she'll play the piano. Um, if you would like to read the dissertation, it is at our website, pianosafari.com, under resources. You'll need a lot of copy to get through it, it's pretty long. Basically what I did in my dissertation is I interviewed uh, these teachers listed here about how they teach technique to beginners. And I chose these teachers because they were well known for their excellent pre-college teaching. Many of them have nationally prize winning students often. So I um, went to their studios and observed a day of their teaching and interviewed them about how they teach technique to beginners. Some of the research questions that I covered in my dissertation are, is there only one way to teach technique to children? How important is the hand shape at the beginning of study? Arm or fingers, which comes first? Legato or non-legato, which comes first? How picky should you be about technique at the beginning of study? Isn't it more important to have fun? And finally, what exercises or pieces are used to develop technique? 
So now I'm going to answer these, re uh, these research questions for you based on what I learned from interviewing and observing these excellent teachers. First, is there only one way to teach technique to children? The answer is no, there are many ways. And um, the teachers that I interviewed came from many technical schools of thought. I had some Russian teachers, some Suzuki teachers, some Taubman teachers. Um, and so these are the commonalities I found among them all. There are many ways to teach technique, but there are common concepts and motions of technique that all students should master. Second, how important is the hand shape at the beginning of study? The answer is that after the first few weeks where a student is what I call finding their arms and their fingers and their basic coordination, hand shape is extremely important. And um, it is a process to form a good piano hand, as I'm sure you've all discovered. And so we need to be diligent about doing this so that they'll be able to play with a good piano hand shape. Arm or fingers, which comes first? Most method books don't um, give any information about this at all. Um, but I found in my research that the teachers all agreed that arm should come first. Control over large muscles comes before control over the small finger muscles. Legato or non-legato, which comes first? The answer is that non-legato should come first. I actually asked this question to every teacher in my study and all of them said non-legato should come first except for one teacher. And she said, well, of course, legato should come first. But then she said, if the student can't do legato, then non-legato should come first because non-legato is easier. The legato comes when the student has gained control over the arm and its coordination with the fingers. How picky should you be about technique at the beginning of study? Isn't it more important to have fun? The answer is that we should be extremely picky, but it is fun to play with good technique. And I use many um, imaginative teaching strategies and a lot of jokes and humor in my teaching. And um, you can see some of these teaching strategies under resources on the website. There are currently 152. And our last research question, what exercises or pieces are used to develop technique? And the answer is that the teachers I studied used a variety of pieces and exercises. But we have developed our own in Piano Safari based on um, the commonalities I found among all the teachers. And we call these the seven animal techniques found in level one. We do have stuffed animals, but stuffed animals are not necessary. They're just fun if you have especially little children. Here's a list of the seven animal techniques, and these are the motions common to all the teachers in my dissertation research. We have arm weight, um, fast repeated notes, the articulations of non-legato and legato, and rotation. So if students can master these basic motions in their first year of study, they will be well set up for all their future piano playing. Oops, going back. So now I am going to... Um, talk through the um, animal techniques and Catherine is going to demonstrate for you. You need to move your mm -hmm. piano. We adjust here. Okay. Hopefully everybody Maybe can see my hands. I'll Maybe be demonstrating a, little down, a bit. Down a little, down a little bit more. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. So let's talk through the seven animal techniques. The first one is the lion paw. And we call it the lion paw because your lion has a very floppy and heavy arm. And um, we have the student flop the arm. Mm -hmm. And then we um, have them drop with a whole hand on the piano first. And make a loud sound. They love to do that, as you might imagine. And for the little ones, I actually have the lion go to sleep. And then if they make a good lion paw drop, the lion wakes up and is really startled. Want to demonstrate that? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And the kids just laugh and laugh over that. Um, after they can do it with their whole hand, um, in the same lesson, usually at the very first lesson, we have them drop with finger two on D. And we use finger two because that's the easiest finger for children to use. And we use D because it's the easiest white key to find because it's right between the groups of two black keys. So um, I have a new little student who's five, 
and she's quite a perfectionist. So she's a little bit tight in her arms. And the first few weeks she did the lion paw, she really didn't have a very floppy lion paw arm. Um, but we kept working on it, and I was happy to see that uh, at about her third lesson, she came in and she had mastered the lion paw. She had found her loose and floppy arm, and it looked just beautiful. So the, some kids will get it right away. Others, it might take a few weeks, but you just keep working with it until they all have their loose arm. Now, I also wanted to mention that each technique exercise has a corresponding rope piece to allow the student to use the motion in a piece. So Catherine is going to play a bit of the King of the African Drum, which is the rope piece that correlates to the lion paw technique. This looks quite complicated, but you'd be surprised at how easily the children pick it up. I have six new beginners this fall, and all of them can play King of the African Drum after about five or six weeks of lesson um, because it's very patterned and it just uses um, finger two with their lion paw drop. Notice how Catherine has a wonderful lion paw arm. She has very loose technique and control over her arm. And um, I was talking recently with a teacher who had skipped the lion paw and the king of the African drum um, because he wasn't quite sure how to teach it. And then he was wondering why his student was playing his reading pieces with a tight hand and tight technique. We have found that learning the technique in rote pieces allows the student to master the motion and develop a fluent technique that can then be applied to reading rather than having to read the notation and form the technique simultaneously. So I encouraged him to go back and teach the lion paw technique. Moving on to the next um, animal exercise is Zechariah Zebra. Check fuzzy house, go. Check your fuzzy house, go. Check your fuzzy house, go. Check your fuzzy house, go. Now, a couple reasons why I'm saying that. Um, we call it Zechariah Zebra because it's the Zechariah Zebra rhythm. And a fuzzy is a little pom-pom with eyes that I have made myself with a glue gun. Um, if you come to MTNA to our booth, we give them out for free. So hopefully we'll come to England someday and we'll be able to give them to you in the UK also. Um, anyway, so um, we have, why don't you demonstrate it with your left hand? Okay, so finger one plays on its corner. When I'm judging um, competitions and um, festivals, I see way too many children that are playing flat on the side of their thumb, which brings the wrist down and causes all sorts of problems. You wanna be up on the corner of your thumb. And when, you, when, you have, when you're up like that with a good hand shape, then the fuzzy can get in his little door between your thumb and your finger too. And he sits in there and you don't wanna kill the fuzzy by making your hand flat. That would be very bad for the fuzzy. Um, and the children just really love to make sure that they have a good um, fuzzy house. So instead of ca calling it a good piano hand shape with the little ones, we call it a fuzzy house. Now, Zechariah Zebra exercise has uh, a rest after each finger so that they can um, readjust their fuzzy house because often when they start playing this exercise, for instance, finger two, um, their hand shape might go out the window like that. And so in the wrist, or in the rest, they can readjust and get their good fuzzy house back before playing the next finger. Now the thumb plays on its corner. Fingers two and three are pretty easy to play. They just play on their fingertips. Finger four, a little trick about finger four is that you might need to play it a little taller than you might think to get it to play on its tip. And finger five plays on the outside corner, not, not too curved, but right on the outside corner. And this exercise takes quite a bit of time for the children to master. Um, but once they get it with a good uh, loose arm and um, nice strong fingertips uh, and a good piano hand shape, then um, that really allows them to play a lot um, of 
fast repeated notes in the future and not be scared of them like I was I used to be scared of fast repeated notes. Um, one more thing about Zechariah Zebra, three of the teachers in my dissertation research used this exercise and I was curious about um, was this just a you know adopted from the Suzuki violin literature or did it have a real reason? So I asked one of the teachers why she taught this exercise and she said that it was to firm the fingertips because I'm sure all of you have run across those floppy fingertips on the ends. Um, and so playing repeated notes is the best way to make those strong as well as making finger circles and having the student press on your knuckle and then pressing on their knuckle. Um, playing repeated notes is another way to work on having those firm fingertips because it's a lot easier to keep a firm fingertip when you're playing on one note than on consecutive fingers. Okay, I'm going to try to move a little bit more quickly. Next is Tall Giraffe. And this is the non-legato exercise. And we call it a Tall Giraffe because at the end of each phrase, um, you make a wrist motion like you're petting the giraffe's neck. It's a tall giraffe. We have students play non-legato for about half of the book before we let them play legato. And this is because it is much easier for children to play with a good tone, stay relaxed in their arm, and keep their good piano hand shape if they are playing non-legato. When they have gained control over the arm and tone and form their good fuzzy house, then we allow them to connect the fingers to form legato in the tree frog exercise. Notice that there's still an arm bounce on each note so that the arm stays involved in the tone production and also to keep the arm relaxed so the fingers connect. And we call it the tree frog because tree frogs have sticky fingers. The next exercise is the kangaroo, which is a review of repeated notes. And it has the kangaroo, kangaroo, kangaroo rhythm. Um, and so they're doing repeated notes again to keep working on firming those fingertips, but without the pause between each finger, because by this point they should be able to keep a good piano hand shape while they're playing. The next animal technique is Soaring Bird. And Soaring Bird is a refinement of the legato into a three note slur with more finger independence. So instead of having an arm bounce on every note like in Tree Frog, they're having one arm motion for the entire phrase. We start with three note slurs because we find that these are easier for students than two note slurs. So we wait for two note slurs until book two. And the last exercise is monkey swinging in a tree. I'll play you the exercise first. And I have this fabulous monkey um, that actually has hands that stick together and students can hang this on their arm to make the monkey actually swing. So you can all see that. I have them try to keep a good piano hand in the air while they work on their forearm rotation with the monkey before they learn that exercise. So the words to that one are monkey swinging in a tree. And there are a few things to uh, think about when teaching rotation. They really have to be up over the keys if the rotation is going to work. They can't be down low. Also, they have to be on strong fingertips and you rotate the entire forearm. It's not any twisting of the wrist, mm -hmm. it's from the forearm. Also, a relaxed thumb is very important. Um, if, if I see that their thumb is sticking up, um, I will say freeze and have them stop on one note, and then I just jiggle their thumb gently to check to make sure it's loose. So with this hand. There you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they get that feeling for a loose thumb while they're stopped before I ask them to have a loose thumb while they're playing, which is harder. So now I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Oh, I need to screen share. There we go. I just wanted... Uh, oh, hold on. I'm just going to hop back in, Julie, to say that it's, it's just you we can see at the minute. I know, it's just me. I can see, too. <laughs> I don't know how to get out. 
Okay, I think... Um, Did we lose Julie? <laughs> I am just going to come back in again. Uh, yes. Oh, Julie's coming back in again. <laughs> oh, I think I'm, I'm back. Am I back? You're back. Yes, you are. Oh, okay, sorry about that. I clicked the wrong thing. I can start talking a bit about um, our philosophy behind rote teaching. That's the next segment of our workshop after technique. So while Julie's working on pulling that uh, PowerPoint back up so you can read along. Um, <clears throat> our definition of rote teaching, we felt it was important to um, formally say because sometimes people have a misunderstanding of what we mean by rote teaching. Oh, there we go. Um, so hopefully you can all see that screen now. Uh, we define rote teaching as the systematic introduction of musical and artistic concepts that are best introduced by modeling rather than from a notated score. Music is an aural art and thus transcends notation. And as Francis Clark has said, uh, sound should come before symbol. So we underlined the word systematic there uh, because it's not a haphazard process, but it's a process that uh, is planned and there's a purpose behind everything that you would teach by rote. Um, and then again, students learn by sound and by modeling, by watching the teacher at the piano. So I just wanted to go through a few myths that uh, people often believe about rote teaching. Um, myth one, students will never learn to read if you teach them by rote. And we have found this to be not true. When you pair rote teaching with a strong reading program, um, it can actually help students to learn to read. Myth number two, students who learn by rote are just parrots and have no understanding what they are doing. Uh, but we have found that students who learn well-selected pieces by rote form an intuitive understanding of musical sound and structure. They hear it, they understand it, and then later um, they learn to read it and they're able to make connections um, between what they understand about music and patterns and sound to what is actually in the notation. And finally, myth number three, students who learn by rote will be resistant to learning to read. Um, but if teachers use different pieces for different aspects of the student's musical development, the student will become musically literate with both eyes and ears. And we have found that both types of pieces benefit students. When I began teaching, I was on the far extreme right of this graphic. I taught only reading with no rote. And that was because that's how I was trained, and I was always a natural reader, so I gravitated towards reading. Most method books are strictly reading books. They teach a student to read, but um, in our opinion, don't necessarily teach them some things about music that are necessary. On the other extreme, there are some teachers and methods who believe in teaching students by rote for the first few years with no notation at all. And this um, can be a problem because students often will get behind in their reading to the point where they never catch up. So when we started writing Piano Safari, we had what we call a light bulb moment. Why not teach reading and rote at the same time? Because there are so many benefits for both. We found that teaching reading pieces and rote pieces simultaneously from the beginning of study allows students to develop the skills necessary to be fully musically literate with both their ears and their eyes. Now we believe that not every piece is a good rote piece. Uh, what makes a good rote piece? We feel that rote pieces should be at the beginning level because by the time you get to the intermediate or advanced levels, of course students should be able to read the notation of those pieces. They should be based on easily memorable keyboard patterns. They should be interesting to the children and much easier to learn by rote than they are by reading the notation. The rote pieces, um, in, with the animal techniques are quite complex, so we wanted to show you a few uh, simpler ones that are at the beginning of Piano Safari. And um, so this is Charlie Chipmunk, which is one of the first pieces they learn. And Charlie Chipmunk um, really fits the criteria that we, Julie just mentioned for what makes a good rope piece. It's based on easily memorable keyboard patterns. It just has two notes, two notes going up and two notes, two notes going down. So even four-year-olds can remember this pattern. One of the benefits of teaching carefully selected patterned rote pieces to beginners is that we are transmitting the idea that music is not a random collection of notes, but is made of patterns. We are constantly surprised by how often our students who have been trained in this way are finding patterns all the time, not only in their rote pieces, but in their reading pieces and in their sight reading cards and they use the patterns they learn in their rope pieces to improvise. 
Um, as you're looking at Charlie Chipmunk here, I just want to emphasize that the score is for teacher reference only. Students learn this piece by watching the teacher's hand at the piano and they model the teacher. So um, a sample lesson would maybe be for a especially young student, a teacher just playing the first two notes and the teacher and the student copies, and then going on to the first four notes and the student copies. So when you're teaching a rote piece, you break it down into very manageable parts and ask the student to imitate you. I'm also just going in, to, oh, okay. sorry. I was just going to play Charlie Chipmunk so you can hear it. Um, so I just also wanted to mention that in the repertoire book, it's easy to tell what type of piece is which by looking at the top right hand corner of the page. So there it says wrote. So this is a signal to the teacher that again, this is not for the student to read off the score. Um, of course, it's in the key of G flat major. So that would be crazy for a first lesson. So um, uh, it's easy for the teacher to tell by looking at the top right hand corner of the book. It'll say if it's reading, improvisation, wrote, or any other category. So uh, we've had a question over here I've seen, um, and teachers often ask us also, how do students remember the rote pieces at home? And uh, we have created a reminder video for every single piece that's taught by Rote and Piano Safari, and it's like a little mini tutorial for the piece. So after students have had their lesson on the rote piece, they can go watch one of these reminder videos at home to practice it accurately during the week. And also the audio that comes with the book is a CD or um, a recording of uh, the pieces, the rote pieces for students to listen to. So they have them in their ears as well. So I I, we'd like to show you a reminder video here. I also wanted to uh, mention that the animal techniques are also taught by rote. So here's mm -hmm. the Charlie Chipmunk reminder video. Play it with all finger two, starting on this black key. One, two, So on our website, if you go to the video section, um, you can see all of the pieces listed in each book alphabetically. Um, so it should be very easy for the parent to find, or you can email them the link for that reminder video for students during the week. Okay, so I'd just like to move on to um, I Love Coffee. This is another really fun rote piece. It's just a favorite with students. Um, it is composed in six variations. So as you can imagine, this really develops in a younger student's concentration for them to be able to play through the piece from start to finish and put all the variations in the correct order. So we feel that's one of the benefits of rote teaching is that it can enhance a student's concentration since they're playing pieces that are way longer often than the typical um, early level reading piece. Uh, so in this piece, again, students are just working on playing with a forearm motion just using finger two. We'd like to show you a video of um, uh, ensemble that Julie's students did as part of a recital. So this is always quite a crowd pleaser. Thank you. 
I want to so mention, I, I'm sorry. sorry if that video quality wasn't the best, but we do have all of these videos on our website and our YouTube channel also. So if you want to go back and watch it and hear the audio really well and see a clear video, you could do that later. And I believe Sharon has the actual links she can email you if you're interested in that. I wanted to mention that all the students in that video wanted to play I Love Coffee in its entirety for the recital. Um, and there wasn't time for that, which is why we did it in ensemble format with each student doing a variation. Okay, moving on to our last topic for today, reading. And students learn um, to read in Piano Safari through their sight reading and rhythm cards and the reading pieces, which are a separate body of pieces from the rote pieces. Our philosophy of reading is that reading music well is half of being musically literate, with the other half being orally literate. Learning to read music should be systematic and much reinforcement and repetition is required for each reading concept. And the longer I teach, the more I realize how true this is and how we need much more repetition than we as teachers might think for students to become competent readers. Students learn to read in four ways. First, recognizing intervals, because Piano Safari is an intervallic approach, finding patterns in the score, connecting the visual with the aural, and learning note names. All of these are important. Notice that they don't only use note names, um, but they uh, use all four of these things. The intervallic reading approach was pioneered by Clark, Goss, Chronister, and Blickenstaff, and it trains students to see the interrelationship of notes rather than viewing each note as an individual unit. Before Catherine and I started um, creating Piano Safari, we had both used a variety of methods and um, we realized that our students who had been trained with an intervallic reading approach were the most confident readers, which is why we wanted to use an intervallic approach in Piano Safari. So I'd just like to go over with you um, an overview of the level one reading approach. Um, in unit one, students begin on the pre-staff using black keys, and then in unit two, um, they're learning their white key names on the piano and working on keyboard geography with finding those, and the pre-staff um, reading pieces are starting on different white keys. Um, in unit three, we move into using exclusively seconds. So in this unit, students are focusing on um, melodic direction, the ups and downs, and also where the music stays the same, or the unisons. Um, in unit four, we use exclusively thirds, and I just want to make it really clear that we're not combining seconds and thirds yet. Um, students need to become proficient with playing thirds and recognizing them in the score, so we're only using thirds in unit four. And then in unit five, uh, we finally combine the seconds and thirds together. Um, and we have a system that we'll talk about here in a moment where students uh, learn to analyze and always look for the different intervals before they play the piece because we want them um, to look for patterns and look for the interval um, before they actually dive into sight reading it. This is a sample sight reading card from the black key unit, um, and it shows, as you can see, um, a picture of where the hand is placed. So the top line is for the right hand, um, the, set, the middle line is for the left hand, and then at the bottom we have a rhythmic tapping exercise. So this is just a way we might have a student mark the card. Uh, the check marks and the smiley faces are just a fun way to mark off repetitions. We want students to play these more than one time. Um, if it's easy for them, each time you can work on something different. Um, for example, you know, if the student nails it straight off, um, I'll ask them to think about something in their technique, for example. Um, so we're trying to build in discipline for repetition even at this early stage of study. Um, the rhythm line on the bottom shows how we actually count uh, the note values. Um, notice that Piano Safari introduces eighth notes right from the beginning, and we're using a syllabic counting system here. So that first measure is ta ti ta ti ta ta, for example. Um, underneath the animal pictures are actually um, important rhythms in repertoire book one. So for example, Zachariah Zebra, the technique exercise that we mentioned earlier, um, is the same rhythm as ta ti ta ti ta ta. So what we're trying to train students to do is to recognize rhythms and larger groupings. So um, we train them to look for this. 
Uh, this rhythm line then could be counted both with the syllables on the ta, and then the second time through, I often have my students go through and say the animal names. So here it'd be Zachariah, Zebra, Charlie, Chipmunk, for example. Um, and there's, if you're interested in this, um, you can email us for more because we have other rhythm, um, core rhythm groupings that we teach throughout Repertoire Book One also. Ocean Animals is one of the first reading pieces. So here, um, even though the rote pieces uh, at this point are have been using finger two, uh, I Love Coffee is right in the same area as Ocean Animals. Um, I Love Coffee is the ensemble you just watched. Um, so and in that piece, students are working on a lengthy piece using forearm technique and finger two. But in Ocean Animals here, um, they're using multiple fingers and learning to identify finger numbers. Um, unit two, this is just showing a sight reading card from pre-staff on the white keys. And we want to mention that students always begin on a different finger number on the different white keys so that they're playing in a variety of keys and they never get locked into any one hand position. So that's always changing. River rafting is a reading piece from the white key unit. Um, the reason that we have these little pictures of rafts here, they're not actually in uh, on the page, but what Julie and I like to do with reading pieces is connect it back to the idea that music is built um, upon patterns. So we ask students to find patterns in their reading pieces. So for example, these two lines are the same, um, so we labeled it as the raft theme. And then on the next page of the piece, uh, line three is completely different. So here we have a picture of uh, rapids, raging rapids, to represent the fact that that was different music. And then uh, the last line of the piece returns to the raft theme. So this is how they're thinking when they're learning their rote pieces. Um, they're thinking of things and themes and matching groupings. And so we want to connect uh, the idea that reading pieces also have that. When they start unit three, it's a big day. I call it staff day. And yesterday I had two um, boys who come in a partner lesson and it was their staff day and they were so excited to get on the staff. So we have landmark notes that we use, treble G and bass C, and all the reading pieces and sight reading cards in book one begin on the landmark notes so that they have an anchor for where to start reading um, from intervallically. But we do have them start on different finger numbers so that they never develop the wrong assumption, for instance, that G equals one, finger one, or anything like that. Here's a sample theory page um, dealing with the seconds and a sight reading card um, in this unit. So notice they're starting on the treble G and then they just read by interval going up and down. At this point, we have them mark the treble clef sign red for right hand and right in the um, G landmark light blue for left hand, right in the C landmark. And then we have them mark the sames or unisons with their sames color, in this case, yellow. And you would be surprised, uh, especially with the younger kids, at how long it takes them to find the notes that are the same and mark them. Uh, we would look at this example and think it's super easy, but for the kids, it does take quite, quite a bit for them to see the sames, especially when they're in different note values, for instance, going from a half note to a quarter note. Um, sorry, I use my American um, terminology. <laughs> I don't quite have the British one <laughs> worked out all the way in my head. Um, and so I call those sneaky sames. They have to find the sneaky sames. So for the right hand example here, we might have, we would have them put their four on the treble G and then go down, down, up, up, down, down, up, up. So they're reading directionally. And um, I also like to make up little stories for these sight reading cards. For instance, the first one, um, you're out walking your dog and you go down the hill and up the hill and down the hill and up the hill and down the hill and up the hill. Um, and they like to tell little stories and make them up too. So that way they're seeing the um, exercise as a whole, um, as a pattern or a story, rather than looking at each individual note. This is an example of a reading piece, their first reading piece on the staff. And again, we have them mark the sames. I'll just play a little bit of it for you. And so it's pretty simple, but they're playing much more complex rote pieces at the same time to balance out their musicianship. 
Moving on to the next unit, so they've just had an entire unit just focusing on reading seconds and sames. And now in unit four, they have an entire unit of just focusing on reading thirds and sames. Again, we have them mark the sames with their sames color. And um, I also wanted to mention that uh, even for my adult students or transfer students, I always have them use the sight reading cards just to fill in any holes that they might have in their reading. And I've had multiple adult students tell me after a while that the sight reading cards are totally helping their reading. So they're anxious to do them. Ferris Wheel is a reading piece with thirds, and I'll just play a little bit of that for you. We also often have them double this in contrary motion or in parallel motion hands together as a challenge. Finally, in the last unit of the book, the students are combining reading seconds and thirds. We feel that many method books combine the intervals way too soon before the student has really had a chance to settle into each interval. So we wanted to delay that um, to make sure that they're ready for it. By this point, they're very good at marking the sames and finding the same. So instead, we have them mark the thirds with their thirds color, in this case, green. So again, for the right hand one, they put their one on the treble G and they read up, down, up, down, same, and then thirds up and down. So they're reading by interval. Um, when we first started experimenting with having students mark the intervals, we were a little nervous that that would become a crutch. Um, but we found that we eventually can wean them off that and um, they suffer no ill effects whatsoever. We feel it's really important for them to analyze um, the intervals and the extra help of marking the intervals is, is really helpful for them. Here is a reading piece um, from the last unit, Talent Show. And notice that these reading pieces are much simpler than the rote pieces that they're playing. And this is because we want to move slowly and systematically in the reading to ensure that the student understands and masters each reading concept. Their technique in playing is moving much more quickly than their reading, but by the end of level two, their reading level is catching up to their rote level. And by level three, there are no more rote pieces because the students can read everything by that point. We feel it takes a good two or three years for students to really become competent readers. So it's worth the time to lay the, the foundation well in reading. Now, um, if you would like to see more sample slides of um, pictures from the book um, or videos, you can visit our website and um, also subscribe to our Piano Safari YouTube channel. Um, so before we take any questions, uh, we just wanted to offer anyone who's interested in exploring or purchasing our materials um, a 10% off your purchase between now through November 15th. And you see the code at the checkout, it's Curious Webinar 10. And our contact information is there at the bottom. So you can just email us if you have any additional questions um, at info at pianosafari.com. And we'd love to hear from you and, um, and answer any questions you might have. So. Um, yeah, right now I think we'll turn it over to Sharon and uh, see what kind of questions we've had for this presentation. Lovely. I'm just coming back in having, um, let's see if I can just turn that back on again. Thank you so much. And what I'm just going to say uh, is that I have, and hopefully I've got that information right, I've just put a comment there. Um, so the 10% lasts until the 15th of November isn't that right yes and the code is curious webinar 10 yes great so just so that everyone now that the screen is gone that they've, they've still got access to that although when I send out the uh, the email I'll put that clearly in there as well so um wonderful and there have been so many questions mm -hmm. flooding in um yeah. so I think what we will do is I mean obviously we have it's a 60 minute webinar, but I think we will we'll try and get through as many of your questions as possible. Um, if any of you have to go, by all means, um, but you will have the 72 hour uh, webinar replay, which 
I will be sending out to everyone who's registered. Um, so if you have to come back and and get you the answer to your question, then that's fine. So I'm just going to go right back down. Sally, do you want to maybe start off the yeah, questions? I, I'm a couple of people have asked about your choice of landmark notes. Um, in particular, why not base F? Why base C rather than base F? We chose intentionally a space landmark and a line landmark that was central in the staff. So um, the reason for the space in line is primarily because our thirds only unit. Um, you want students to recognize that thirds can go from line to line to line or space, space, okay. space. Also, so it's that's much easier for, yeah, it's easier for children to remember a line and a space and not get the two line landmarks mixed up also. Mm, no, I, th I think that's really, really interesting. And, and, you know, I think it just typifies everything that you've done about this, that it's been so thought, thought through from start to finish. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Okay, Sharon, over to you. Okay, I'm just going to see. If no, I, I can. I can actually see another question. Um, somebody's asking whether it's for Heidi's asking when it will be for sale in Canada. Is it already for sale in Canada? We ship anywhere in the world. Um, shipping between the U.S. and Canada is um, a little less problematic and expensive than it was to other parts in the world. So we focused first on getting it um, with Alfred UK uh, so they can distribute it in Europe. And then we also have a distributor in Australia now. Um, so Canada is our next step. But yes, if you're in Canada, you can order from our website and we can ship it to you. So Yeah, so good. Great. Uh, one other question here is, um, and I think a couple of people have asked it, I see Tracy has asked it, and she's curious to know why you start with finger two and not finger three. We actually had started to use finger three when we first, you know, envisioned this, um, but then we took a poll of all the children that we taught and they vehemently opposed finger three and wanted to start <laughs> with finger two. So we realized that for kids, finger two is easier. And we use a middle finger in the hand to balance the hand and make sure the arm is aligned behind the hand. Okay, great. Um, another question here from Deborah, who says, do you think parents or carers should come to lessons with young pupils? That would be nice. We realize it's not always possible, but we welcome parents when they can come. And also we um, make a point of sending the links to the videos to the parent. I always email them the links, even though they can always get on the website also, just to encourage them that yes, this, you know, watching the videos is important. And here are the links right there to make it as easy as possible for them right. to find them. Yes. And I think just to, to reiterate, because on your website, um, pianosafari.com, you have got loads and loads of videos, because I think there, there were questions. Um, at the beginning of the webinar about you know this rope playing word and of course it's the videos on your website that are so useful and again mm -hmm. to, to point um, parents in, in that direction. So we have um, oh I wanted to mention we have reminder videos like we showed and we also have performance videos of kids playing some of the pieces and then instructional pieces of select rope pieces to show a teacher how they might go about teaching it. Um, and also we have step-by-step, um, page-by-page teacher guides for each book on the website also. Great. Sally, do you have another question there? I'm just... Yeah, the, the, there is a question from Molly, and she says, how do you recommend teaching young students to identify keys by their letter name? For example, on the reading card, how should the student find out which note to start on? Um, are you... I wonder if she's speaking of finding the white keys on the piano or from yeah. the staff. There, there almost seems to be two questions there, I, I, I think. I think mm -hmm. the first one is, how, how do you recommend teaching young students to identify keys? Okay. The white and keys I would assume the, 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 the keys on the piano, yeah. We have a very fun rope piece called Alphabet Boogie, where they literally yeah. play from the bottom A of the piano to the very top note, um, saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and it has a little accompaniment. So we repeat that quite a bit. Um, and then uh, we have a theory page in our book that recommends they find all the C's, all of the D's, et cetera. Um, also, we also we're, have, go ahead. We also have them decorate the piano. So um, we have them put bouncy balls on the groups of two black keys. Mm -hmm. And then I have these um, plastic caterpillars that go on the three black keys and then made foam letters that go on each of the white keys. 
Um, so we decorate the piano and have other uh, games like that that they can use mm -hmm. to learn those. Because it does take them quite a while to master the white keys. So we want to keep working on that throughout. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that that was something that you were talking about and somebody else sort of uh, has picked up on the fact that this whole thing takes much longer, <laughs> that we tend to rush, you know, because, yes. and, and I keep going on about the fact that as experts, we forget what it was like mm -hmm. to learn in the first place. And we rush mm -hmm. and we assume, we make all these assumptions. So I'd say to everybody out there, it doesn't matter what we're doing, we have got to be, I'm gonna come back to my favorite words, we've got to be persistent with the way that we teach and consistent in the way that we teach. Don't go changing after doing it for two or three weeks because you think it hasn't worked. No, it's not that, it's just that the child is learning mm -hmm. at their own pace. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. I'm actually writing a blog post right now, a series of blog posts about reading, and it has to deal. It deals with that very thing. How yeah. I really believe it takes at least three years for kids to become oh, yeah. really competent yes. readers. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you can be on the lookout for that blog post. Yeah, <laughs> should it be? <laughs> and one thing we also do is go back and have students review old levels of sight reading cards that they've already passed. So, for example, some of my students in the level two now, um, I'll have them play some cards from level one. And it gives them such confidence because it's easier for them. Um, mm -hmm. When they go back through them, I, we don't have them mark the intervals. They just have to sight read it um, and so that they can learn to do it without as much analysis. Um, and we cycle through that the whole um, time we're taking them through the levels of piano safari. So mm -hmm. um, they're kind of working ahead in their sight reading at, a, at, at their level and then also reinforcing the lower levels. And that really um, builds up their reading. Mm. There, uh, there's a, a, a question from Crystal here and she's asking about um, where do you start an older transfer student with your materials? So age 10 to 11. Um, would you start them with the animal techniques in book one? Any thoughts on that? I think it does depend on your student and their uh, maturity and, um, you know, uh, the kinds of things that they're into at that age, because mm -hmm. some 10 and 11 year olds will be completely fine in level one. Um, others may feel that it's, you know, too young for them, in a sense, with the lyrics and pictures. So um, with all of this said, our uh, next project after our theory books is that we will be writing an older beginner version of Piano Safari. So um, hopefully, you know, within a year, it's it's. But until then, um, for an older student, you can definitely use the sight reading cards um, and probably the, the technical exercises and rope pieces um, and the animal techniques are important to teach them. So we have a supplemental book you can buy rather than level one. Um, I mentioned it's technical exercises and rope pieces. You can find it on our website. It just has the rope pieces and animal techniques in it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think I think we're just about coming to the end, really, aren't we, Sharon? Because I think you need to wrap up. But um, there's a couple more questions. Um, length of lessons. H how long would you recommend? Thirty or forty-five minutes, or an hour? I, I do forty-five or an hour. I mm -hmm. don't do thirty-minute lessons. Um, I just feel like it's too short, even for the littlest ones. Yeah. Because yeah. it's almost like you need a longer lesson with the littlest ones to make sure everything is solidified before they go home and practice. And also that gives us more time to play games and to have fun with them. Um, so that's what I do. And then we also do teach Piano Safari in groups and in partner lessons. I saw there was a question about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I teach some partner lessons and Katie right now is teaching some group classes with her pedagogy students. Um, so that's a great way to do it too. We find that the combination of rote pieces and reading pieces uh, works really well in a group class because every student in the class can feel like um, they're doing well with their strength and working on their weaknesses at the same time. How many would you have in a group? Four tops. <laughs> <laughs> it's group enough, isn't it, on the piano? I have six in my class, but again, as Julie mentioned, I have actually four um, Ohio University pedagog pedagogy students assisting me. So um, okay. I teach a 30 minute group portion to the six children and then they go off and they do partner lessons with the uh, college pedagogy students so it but yeah okay. probably if it was just you under six <laughs> yeah. yeah okay uh, yeah. I, th I think Deborah has asked this question again on root pieces um, do you place the music on the rack we do just so that they can get used to seeing a complicated score but um, we don't really refer to it that much until about level two when they're starting to make more connections between um, the, the score and what they're learning on the keyboard. 
Um, and also there's like a little picture on the page, so they might want to see a picture of Charlie Chipmunk. Um, and we find that just having it on the score, they, they get the idea that um, a complicated score is not intimidating. So when, once they start reading more complicated music, um, they never feel intimidated by a score because they've seen complicated scores the whole time, even if they haven't been actually reading it. Yeah. Sure. yeah, and it, it's a really important point, I think, that is, isn't it, that actually we need to be exposing children to music, to what it looks like, the written score, mm -hmm. um, yeah. in the same way as we do with books. You know, we don't right. expect them suddenly to pick up a, a book having never seen words before. They've been familiar with them since they were, you know, mm -hmm. young babes yeah. or whatever. So exactly the same thing. Yeah. Just going to ask um, questions. I think, I don't think we've, yes, Elizabeth has a question. Um, and she says, do you jump around the book somewhat or do you cover each piece completely before starting on the next? So in other words, is it kind of real, that sense of progression throughout the book? Um, <clears throat> or do you hop around? We try to stay within a unit. So they're working on pieces within the unit. But within the unit, we do jump around depending on what the student needs. So we might assign a, a rote piece and a reading piece. And then the next week, maybe another reading piece or... Um, an improvisation. So we stay within the unit, but we jump around within it. Um, and we try to have them have as many pieces as possible on their assignment. So they'll stay at the piano longer at home. Um, so we might introduce uh, three, two or three new pieces each week, and then they're continuing to play the pieces they already know from that unit also, so that they eventually will know all 10 or 12 pieces in that unit before they move on to the next one because yeah. they correlate with the sight reading cards too. So we stay within the unit, which one. Mm. I think we could go on. I mean, the, the questions keep, <laughs> keep, keep coming in, don't they? Um, but I, I, I think, you know, you've given everybody a, a, a lot to think about. And if you haven't yet, you know used or discovered piano safari i would really recommend that you you go and have a look at it i think one of the reasons why i get so excited is because it very much goes along and supports the research that i've done which uh you know has been based in the uk and looking at tutor books and uh, I, I don't know which one of you was it that said but um you know most tutor books especially the uk ones are based on reading notation. Mm -hmm. They're about learning to read notation. They're not about becoming a pianist or yeah. even becoming a pianist who can read. <laughs> um, so I think that's one of the reasons why uh, I, I think, you know, Piano Safari is very different and it is innovative in the very best of ways. And it's, it's based on, on really thorough uh, research. And I think the, the, the quality of it just, just shows through. So go and try it if you haven't yet. <laughs> Thank you, a lot, Sally. Of the question, a lot of the questions can be answered on the website through reading some of the mini essays under resources and also the teacher guide. But we're happy to answer questions by email also if people have specific questions. Sure. Yes, because I'm, I'm just saying there are everywhere. If people are still, are still coming in with, with, um, uh, with different questions. Maybe just... If we finish off with, um, let's say, um, yeah, Crystal is, is saying, do you find one of the animal techniques generally more difficult for students to learn? I think Zechariah Zebra is probably the hardest one. Mm -hmm. It just takes longer for it to settle in because they're working on forming their piano hand at the same time. So as um, Sally said, we have to be persistent. Yeah. Yeah, we have to be persistent. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's not going to be perfect. Nothing's going to be perfect no. right away. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it takes time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm just going to, people are talking about sulfur and they're talking about the rhythm names and things. And, and I, I've never really thought this before, um, but, you know, in the Curious Piano Teachers, we also have, and I don't know whether Sharon's going to mention Let's Play, which is our, um, our short series based on very simple songs, which helps to develop musicianship because mm -hmm. at our heart we have to be musicians first in mm -hmm. uh, the piano is just our instrument through which we can express our, our our musicianship but we have to be musicians first and that's exactly what let's play does and you'll find a lot of crossovers in terms of the use of rhythm names 
I mean, we're using TAR and TETE rather than TT, but it's exactly the same thing. Um, rhythm names and uh, the development of, of, you know, Kodai in terms of um, singing names and stuff like that. So in terms of musicianship, it makes a very nice support, I would say, for piano safari. <laughs> yes, and I think that kind of links in with it. There's a, a couple of questions here. Let me see if I can just find it again. Um, yeah, someone's saying, would it be possible to have this webinar video permanently um, on your website? Um, there is a 72-hour replay that we are giving you access to. And the thing is, for people who are members of our online membership site, every single webinar uh, that we run, whether it's one for members or whether it's one like this one that is open for registration right around the world to everyone, is interested um, they all go on to our, our website so for if you're a member of the community of the curious piano teachers you will have unlimited access to this replay um, if you're not a member then unfortunately it will just be available for 72 hours um, but of course just to and I'm going to just post the link now I had it typed there just a moment ago um, uh, we will be going and we will be sending out an email. Uh, Catherine mentioned links, and yes, I will be including links. Um, the one question I'm going to ask Julie is, I have nearly forgot about that, I don't know whether or not you are happy to share the slides with us. I know there's music on there, yes. so I can are you happy to do that? Okay, so if you can send that over to me more or less right away, I will also send out um, a PDF copy of the slides because I know for some of you it got a little bit blurry at times and you weren't able to read it. Hopefully I'll, they... I'll try Sorry, because uh, the other day when I tried to send a PDF of, of this um, it was too big to send mm. so but I'll try again. <laughs> sure maybe even something like we transfer we can we can be in touch yeah, about that I can but yeah that. so so we will try and get the uh, a PDF copy of the slides for you and um, also, what Sally was mentioning at the very beginning, again, we um, enrollment to our online membership site, the community, is, is normally closed. We only open twice a year for a week at a time. But for the next 72 hours, whilst this replay is available, we are also opening enrollment. Now, there is a limited number, and I know that nearly 600 have registered for this webinar. We have only 20 spaces. So again, in that email, look out for it. If you want to hop in, um, you probably need to do it pretty quickly. <laughs> um, and uh, again, in, in the email I'll send, there will be a brochure so that you can find out a little bit more about the community. Basically, you get monthly bundles of teaching resources, um, teaching videos. Uh, Sally, do you want to maybe just wrap up by saying a little bit more, even though I will say, guys, that the brochure will tell you pretty much what you need to know. It, it's a very exciting place to be, actually, the community, <laughs> to be to be absolutely honest. Um, Sharon and I get very excited about creating our monthly bundles, as I think I said at the beginning. I think one of the most exciting things, though, is the, is the community itself, the sense of together we are stronger than being individuals as piano teachers. Together we have a voice. Um, together we can actually really begin to show how piano teaching can move forward. So we have a curiosity lounge, for example, and Catherine and Julie are both members of this as well. And there are some fabulous conversations that go on within that uh, curiosity lounge that are unlike other conversations on other Facebook groups, I have to say. Uh, do, you, do you agree, Julie and Catherine? Yes, and much yeah, yeah. nicer too. <laughs> much nicer, because we won't let it be any other way. You know, the, They're the, very the insightful, a, wonderful yeah, conversations. Really yes. is, absolutely, absolutely. You put up a question, it doesn't matter how basic a question it is. Somebody, several people will come in and give you their experience, their thoughts. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It is insightful. It is supportive. It is nourishing. It is inspirational as as a as a place for us to go as piano teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd love to see you um, in the community and and engaging in within all these different things. Um, if, if you're based in America, um, I'd love to see you because I'm coming over to the MTNA conference in March Yay. and I'm doing a present. Yay! I'm doing <laughs> we'll a presentation there. there. 
called Let's Play. So we'll be doing lots of having lots of laughter and lots of playing and lots of, lots of singing. When I say play, I mean, you know, play play rather than piano play. Um, <laughs> so we'll be doing lots of singing and showing you how you transfer that onto the piano. So if you're in America and you're thinking of going, then do come. Um, Sharon, unfortunately, can't make it because um, Sharon will have a... Uh, a five-week-old baby by that five-week-old baby oh, well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I'm really looking forward to, to meeting you there and I know um, Julie and Catherine are going to be there as well so um, we will uh, we'll all hopefully hook up and have a curious piano teacher dinner or something like that we're, we're threatening for anybody who's a member by that point <laughs> so thank you very much Julie and Catherine I'm going to hand back over to Sharon lovely Okay, so what I'm going to say is just look out for the email that will be coming your way probably within the next hour. Um, and again, if you have any other questions, just simply reply to the email. Um, again, I know that uh, Joey and Catherine have said that you're very welcome to email them as well. And can I just say in closing, um, you do have a, a Facebook group, Joey and Catherine. Yes, we do. It's I know it's, it's a closed group, but can anyone, if they request access, how does that work? If they yes, request access, access teaching piano. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Katie. <laughs> I was just going to say the name of the group is Teaching Piano Safari. So use that to search on Facebook. Um, and yes, I just uh, review all member requests. And if you're a piano teacher, I grant access. So um, we would love to have you. It's a, it's a wonderful discussion community where um, you can ask some of these questions too, and you'll also have perspective from other teachers who use Piano Safari. Fantastic. Well, listen, it's been one very exciting webinar, <laughs> and it has been a, it really has been our pleasure to have you on the call. Thank you so much for giving up your time um, you. and presenting this for us. Uh, you know that we we very much love your approach and even just in the way you were able to answer some of those questions mm -hmm. it's very easy to tell that you know this is a thoroughly researched uh, approach to teaching beginners and um, we very much certainly at the curious piano teachers we very much appreciate when resources are as well researched as piano safari um, mm -hmm. so Again, I'm going to say a big thank you to everyone who has joined us um, on the live webinar. And if you're listening to the replay, again, <laughs> it's lovely to have you with us at that later stage. Um, and I will be sending an email to you very, very soon. So in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your weekend, guys. And uh, we hope to see you very, very soon. Bye for now. Thank Bye. you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Yes, thanks. Bye. Bye.